I am excited to walk um, this place because it has taken me many places. I'm not a Filipino, I come from Malawi, it's the poorest country in the world. But through studying the works of Nora Kebro, through studying the works of uh, Felix Librero, who I admire so much and I consider one of the most intelligent people I've ever met, through studying the works of Alexander Flo, and a lot of people within the institution uh, 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 that we define as investors of the Philippines Los Banos, including Seo Cadiz, who is working here as a knowledge management specialist. I have come to be known as a specialist in communication for development. But the truth is, this country, you know, this university is what can constitute for me as a place where it is, you know, experts are being trained in communication for development. So I don't deserve to come here and talk to you about communication for development. In fact, I'm supposed to sit down in the audience so that you can teach me about communication for development. Nevertheless, I strongly believe that, you know, through teaching, through my professional experiences, I have a little bit of things to share with you. So to begin our discussion today, um, we go back a little bit to the 2008 financial crash, um, where a lot of banks contributed to a lot of economic, socio-economic problems that we face in the world today. Now, in the aftermath of the crash that occurred, especially in the Western world, and we felt the ripples, the ripple effects in the global south, a group of students like you at the University of Manchester in England established what they called a post-crash economic society. Now, this group of students was fascinated by what had caused the crash itself, and why a lot of experts, who call themselves experts, had not foreseen this crisis. So one of the objectives of the post-crash economic society was to lobby a lot of the social sciences uh, training within universities to be inclusive when it comes to training graduates like yourself. Now, a major observation of that society was that social science training I'm using the word social science here in very holistic terms, should actually enable students to acquire a holistic understanding of the world. And to do that, they propose curriculum developers, researchers as well as trainers, should actually make a deliberate effort to bring into the classroom knowledge and research that destabilizes dominant discourse. Now, this is in 2008 the debate taking place within the Western world. But a similar debate had already started, had already taken root within the corridors of the University of Los Banos in the 1950s. So my discussion today is to celebrate that discussion, is to actually call upon all of us here to begin to rethink the kind of discussion that was started by a wonderful group of scholars within the College of Agriculture by the name of Nora Quebro, Felix Librero, Juan Yamias, if I'm pronouncing it properly, and many, many other scholars. That would lead into the establishment, the framing of the field that we call communication for development, or as you prefer to refer to here, development communication, or as others, nevertheless, prefer to refer to as communication for social change. So, what am I talking about? What I want to talk about here, uh, partly, will also come from my forthcoming book, which is titled Speaking Development with Communities, which is published by Rutledge next year. So I'm sharing you know, with you whatever it is that I think about this topic. So over 50 years ago, a small group of Filipino agriculture scientists embarked on a journey that would change the way we think about development today. By development, I'm not just alluding to figures and numbers that are employed to scientifically explain the human condition. I'm also referring to the development that my great-grandmother used to talk about, the development that one can eat, the development they can drink, the development they can touch. In fact, I'm talking about the development that allows people to live close to their ancestral graves. 
this group of uh, scholars recognize that it is not enough to have very fancy knowledge management and exchange models that it discussed, and of course continue to discuss the possibility of transferring agricultural um, knowledge on best based practices to end users. I'm talking about rural and farming communities. For the first time, these pioneering scholars were concerned with humanizing development and ensuring that people like my great-grandmother contribute to the definition and contestation of the concept of development itself. In fact, one of the objectives of CIRCA is to promote and facilitate high-quality postgraduate studies and degrees. So what kind of graduates are these? Or in other words, considering CIRCA's principal objective is to ensure the harnessing of science and education for agricultural development, how do we ensure that new agriculture, science, and technology filter well to the people on the ground? How critical is this high-quality graduate? I'm talking about you. In this brief reflection that emerges of my forthcoming book, Speaking Development with People, I will try to curate what I define as a pedagogy of listening, in which emphasis for international public goods universities included, is to train graduates who have mastered the tools uh, for, mastered the tool, tools and skills for living and engaging with people. Writing in the London Times Supplement of 1966, the British Marxist historian Edward Palmer Thompson propounded the notion of history from below as a form of historical reconstruction that requires scholars to read and unpack, as well as appreciate historical events from the perspective of marginalized groups, especially those that the postcolonial scholar Gayatri Spivak defined as having no lines, no access to lines of social mobility. E.P. Thompson would indeed test this new theoretical and methodological trajectory through the writing and publication of this beautiful book, The Making of the English Working Class. And I commend that, recommend rather, that if you have time, please you know, go online, go into the library, and find this beautiful book, The Making of the English Working Class, which would cement the notion of history from below as a major scholarly tradition. Now, I started with 2008 in the UK, talking about the financial crash, uh, financial crash. Students say, look, we need a new way of teaching the social sciences. We need a new way of teaching in the universities that allows us to actually understand that there are alternative ways of looking at the world. I'm going back a little bit to England again, because a lot of our education is very Eurocentric. I'm going back to England in the 1960s, and here Edward Palmer Thompson, a very respected scientist and historian, is talking about constructing history from below. It's a popular notion within the social sciences. But as I said, all these developments are taking place when the University of the Philippines at Los Banos had already started talking about these things. Now, one of the concerns I've always had in my teaching journey, when I taught at London School of Economics, I taught in Denmark, I taught in Sweden, I mean everywhere I went, was that even though a lot of people do know that the University of the Philippines at Los Banos, especially the College of Agriculture, has had the pioneering spirit. They were the pioneers of the field, the practice, and the, you know, the methodological pathway that we call communication for development. Even though they know, you look at the publications that are coming out of you know, Western publishers, they don't acknowledge that. In fact, you see a lot of readers today, I don't use them in my, my, my teaching anymore. They talk about these things as if they started from the West. Now, what I want to encourage you today is to begin to think radically, as teachers, as researchers, as well as as practitioners. Because what I'm talking about here is rethinking the whole concept of Wetterschauung. In German, the, uh, the German philosopher defined this concept as Wetterschauung. I will write it for you. But it's to question what we think is normal, to question dominant syntax to question uh, the notion that uh, Slavoj Zizek, if you know this philosopher, defines, that, defines as the parallax view, you know, to destabilize this dominant thinking, to displace the original Filipino thinking around communication for development and to replace it with something new. And by doing that, 
there is a lot of things that are changing. It's not just replacing the Filipino notions and philosophies around communication for development. It's also you know, replacing the world view that accompanied the thinking around communication for development. And it has huge impact in terms of the way we see um, agricultural and rural development. Now, there is a major observation in the preface to that book by E.P. Thompson. He notes, that's the philosopher of history from below, I'm seeking to rescue the poor stockinger, the Luddite cropper, the absolute handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded follower of Joanna Southcourt from the enormous condensation of posterity. Now, talking about these marginalized groups, he says, their crafts and the traditions may have been dying. Their hostility to the new industrialism may have been backward looking. Their communitarian ideals may have been fantasies. Their insurrectionary conspiracies may have been foolhardy. But they lived through these times of acute social disturbance, and we did not. Their aspirations were valid in terms of their own experience, and if they were casualties of history, they remain condemned in their own lives as casualties. Now, what was it talking about? That is very relevant for us as students in the Philippines. On one hand, I'm criticizing Western education and Western approaches towards education, but why do I think it is special that we pay attention to another Western thinker? Now, in emphasizing the quest to rescue uh, Thompson was not being dismissive of the agency of the marginalized and oppressed groups to construct their own history. Far from it. In fact, as if conversing with Thompson in 1988, the Indian American postcolonial thinker Gayatri Spivak, in that beautiful article that you can download, free download, I know students love free downloads. <laughs> you know, this beautiful article can be subaltern speak. It would confirm the immense power and ability of marginalized groups to master the art of employing radical communicative acts and actions as pathways towards achieving self-actualization and empowerment. This point is critical because it was the foundation principle, it was the founding principle upon which the agricultural scholars within the College of Agriculture founded or began to think of communication for development. The idea that people have the ability, they have the agency, they have in it within themselves to actually rescue themselves, not anybody. So in terms of the way we think about our teaching, in terms of the way we think about our research, there is a recognition by Thompson, by Spivak, and of course, earlier on, by the group of scholars at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, that you don't bring change in any community. You cannot take development into the community. You cannot take anything into the community. Development is that contact point between the experience of outsiders and the lived realities of the people that we are working with. That contact point is where you can find development itself. So, why do all these things matter? First, to begin with, Thompson talks about rescuing the marginalized groups from the enormous condensation of posterity. The moral ethos of this concept is well illuminated by Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who is a very good friend of the current Pope, uh, who, in the wonderful book, A Theology of Liberation, introduces the notion of preferential, preferential option for the poor. Gutierrez notes that if there is no friendship with the poor people, there is no sharing of the life of the poor. As a result, there is no authentic commitment to liberation because love exists only among equals. So I'm not talking about uh, uh, love as in sending a text message that I love you, I miss you. That's not the love I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the romantic love that you know moves people during Valentine. I'm talking about the commitment that we have to a particular cause. So when you say, I love you, when you say, I love this work, you are so dedicated to the work, you are honest in terms of the approaches, in terms of the ethos, in terms of the commitment that you give to this work. Now, what Thompson, as well as Gutierrez, were calling for here, is a new kind of scholarly pedagogy in which historical writing takes on ethnographic and moral responsibilities. Ethnographic in that the studying of oral history or studying of history of the common people will no longer rely on a positivist and empiricist ethos. 
So when I'm using these words, I know sometimes they sound very easy, but as a teacher I realize that sometimes students may not understand what I'm talking about. And I think the purpose of communication is not to stand here and prove to you that I'm knowledgeable by introducing very fancy and confusing words. I don't think that serves anybody's purpose. Now when I'm talking about positivist or empiricist you know, ethos, all I'm talking about is a modernist, a scientific way of looking at the world. You know, it's a rational way of looking at things. It's very theoretical, it's very Western, and it's rooted in Western science. Which means when you're talking about these things, immediately we are disregarding and footnoting other ways of looking at the world. So the focus here is building long and trusted relationships with the people we are working with. This implies that our work in agricultural communication, extension included, rural development as well as development communication, should aim to articulate the experiences of people on the ground, to give voice, to give prominence to this voice, to give prominence to their thoughts, ideas, innovations and knowledges. In this case, we are talking about agriculture and rural development, development policy formulation that deliberately and carefully brings people like my grandmother into the planning and implementation process. Now, we're not just doing this for the sake of numbers. This is an honest and sincere effort to allow my great-grandmother to be a colleague in the process of thinking about development. In my conversations with Librero yesterday, I had a wonderful conversation with Professor Felix Librero, who I want to believe that most of you know. And if you don't, I'm going to crucify you because you have to <laughs> take the deliberate effort to appreciate what is going on here. And I'm telling you, I have, this is just a comment, I have been to many places to talk about communication for development. But it is not my communication for development. It is the communication of development of Nora Kebro, of Felix Eguerero. These are giants. So take time to study these people. Spend the time. Sometimes if you have a little bit of money, but you know, say, can we have some coffee? They have a lot of wisdom about the field, a lot of wisdom about life. So in my conversations with Professor Ibrero yesterday, you know, when he worked as a development broadcaster and station manager for Radio DZLB, his focus, he says, he emphasized that, was always on bringing the community into the studio. I'm not talking about physically, empirically. Even when they were still in their homes. What he was talking about here in his wisdom, I think, he was talking about the notion of representation. That he curated his work, he curated his programs, he curated his understanding of development to allow for these local people, these marginalized farmers, to have a say even if they are not there. Now, I would like to believe at a certain point that perhaps Felix Librero was talking about a Marxist concept of representation which in the wonderful book that Marx wrote, the 18th Romeo of Louis Bonaparte, he says there somewhere that they cannot be represented, they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. Now, Marx was not just talking about the inability of people to represent themselves, he was talking about the notion of consciousness. Now, this is very critical, because when we are talking about representing the, the thoughts of people, sometimes they may be misinformed about issues. It could be birth control, it could be new farming methods, but we have to undertake the sacred duty of not just informing them, of working with them to help them understand new knowledges. And that's very important. That's why the tools and skills for living and engaging with people are very fundamental, they're very important. The communities should be present in our thinking. Their thoughts and well-being should be the foundation of program planning and delivery. Which means when we're talking about rural development, agricultural development included or inclusive, interventions should begin and end with people. In this case, therefore, to write history, according to E.P. Thompson, as in designing and implementing agricultural development interventions, implies that we take the side of the poor. It now becomes a political project. The marginalized, the classless, and that we understand their viewpoint, which then becomes an intellectual and programmatic pedestal for formulating policies in question, constructing and implementing a discursive imaginary. So I'm going to simplify that. All I'm saying is, when we're doing our work, we should make sure we should have the interest of the people we are working with at heart. That's all. That's all I'm saying. And that's a fundamental that guided 
the pioneering work of the University of Los Banos College of Development, uh, uh, College of uh, uh, Agriculture. To write history in this case means that we are going to war, we are going to battle, not literally with guns and knives, against the structural inequalities that perpetuate what the post-colonial thinker Ennis Cesar defines as the thingification of subaltern groups. So when I'm talking about thingification, it's thing, the way you think and then you add thingification. I'm talking about being passionate about certain things, about certain ideals, taking pride in actually working with people on certain issues. One of the unfortunate things about our family, where I grew up in Africa, is that a lot of my sisters have changed men, you know, they have married one man after the other. It's like a disease that takes place in the community. So there was this moment, there was this time, I think, when I was still doing my PhD, I went back home to Malawi to visit my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, who I loved very much. She was my favorite person. And this time, I found that my sister had come back to our compound because the husband was beating her up. And I was very angry, actually. I was really, really angry. I don't want to use the words that describe what I felt at that particular point in time. So we were arguing, because my argument, my mother was there and everybody was there, my argument was she should leave the husband. And we didn't want to go through the com complicated and complex processes of divorce. I just said, no, if you want my help, I'll go there and pick up your stuff. And the baby, of course. Now, my mother, she's a very intelligent woman, very strong. She's not educated, but very wise. She insisted, no, leave her to make her own decision. But the way she said it was like she was batting her heart. And I thought, in my own opinion, that if a man is just beating up the wife, immediately, you know, they should divorce, you should pick her up. And I remember in the confrontation, it was really serious. And, I, you know, after that, I think I couldn't speak to my mother for a couple of, you know, a couple of months. My mother was really angry with the way I was reacting to this issue. So she walked up to me, she touched me on the chin here. She said, Linji, you're only a man, you will never understand a woman. Now, there is something that is, there is, there is, something that is important here. I, somebody might think she was very condescending. But I did not take time. Look, I was just a of the situation. I did not listen to many perspectives as to what had contributed to this. I'm not saying women should be beaten when they're having relationships, because other relationships, because my sister was having another relationship. So the, the point was, I did not have the full facts to make any decision on an issue that did not concern me. That was the point of my mother. And it took me a long time to learn a lot of these things. So what we are saying here is that whatever we do when we're working with people, it's important to, to understand the context within which issues are taken, you know, within which issues uh, uh, are being calibrated. The second issue that is very important that Thompson raises, he uh, uh, concerns living through these times of acute social disturbance. He says, their communitarian ideals may have been fantasies, their insurrectionary conspiracies may have been pulled up full-hearted, but they lived through these times of acute social disturbance, and we did not. <laughs> so by this, Thompson does not imply that we have to write their histories, articulate their feelings and needs only. Rather, he's encouraging us as experts and scholars to undertake an ethical journey. Ethical is very important. That is sacred duty of historical writing. With empathy, muy importante, this is very important. With empathy, understanding, compassion, and should lead to a careful study for purposes of coexistence and enlargement of horizons. That's what Edward Said says in the new preface, 2011, if I'm not mistaken, to the wonderful book, Orientalism, that he published in 1978. So it talks about the importance of understanding other people with empathy. Now, empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy, you can say, look, oh, you had a bad you know, crop yield this year. You know, I really feel sorry for you. That's sympathy. You can feel sorry for somebody. Empathy, you go beyond that. You look at the thing, you look at a problem from their perspective, and together you try to do something about it. So empathy is the older brother or older sister of sympathy. You go beyond just sympathizing with a situation. You want to enrich your understanding. You want to enrich uh, uh, your understanding of a particular issue. Well, we may argue 
we do invite community groups and organizations to the policy making tables and gatherings. The issue here is to prevent manipulation of people's voices by misinforming them, making them rubber stamp certain agendas, outwitting them, especially in these policy and uh, planning sessions. This poses a challenge for both formal and informal training programs in communication for development and social change. The question being, how do we produce students, graduates, and professionals who have mastered the tools for living with for engaging with uh, people. In a 2006 media development article, Alfonso Gomusio and Clemencia Rodriguez describe a new type of communicator who is equipped with all the necessary know-how, competencies and commitment to work hand in hand with those engaged in development and social change processes. The lesson here is that agriculture and rural development knowledge management and exchange models should begin and end with local people. We have said that. These models should capture the people's way of looking at the world. Now, that's very important. The voice and the perspective are very different things. So, it's actually challenging for us because if it's about research, we have to design the research instruments. Whether at evaluation stage or baseline stage or formative stage, we have to design the instruments in such a way that they reflect the perspective of the people we are working with. So that research does not become an extractive process of collecting information that will not make sense to anybody apart from the policy makers sitting in res expensive restaurants and drinking coffee there. Third, Thompson's observation about they lived through these times of acute social disturbance implies that local people that we work with are the best representatives of their own agendas, no matter how extensive our field work is. I'm not saying they know what is best for them. I'm saying they are the best representatives they are able to articulate their agendas properly. But we have to structure our interventions, we have to structure our research, we have to structure any sort of interaction in such a way that empowers people to actually make sincere, radical, and committed resolutions and contributions to these processes. Because we may find out that in the process of doing this, we learn new things, and oftentimes this is the case. A very good example comes from Italy. I, I'm a huge fan of history, so I'm going to make you know, references to some of the things. Italy in 1949, it was the end of the Second World War. And you remember, if you follow the history of Europe, Italy was in alliance with Germany. And they were dragged into that war. They were not supposed to be into that war, but it was an alliance between Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. Germany being in war, Italy was forced to you know, uh, be part of this war. And it was very costly. I mean, the Allied bombings were very costly. You know, they were so destructive and, you know, destroyed much of the economy in, uh, in Italy. And Italians were not happy. After the Second World War, Italy was also flirting with the idea of joining NATO. They didn't want anything to do with military alliances. So there were a lot of demonstrations, especially in the small city called Umbria in the north, where there was a steel factory. Now, every time workers were coming out of their ships or joining the ships, there were a lot of demonstrations, singing, and people were happy. But, you know, it was big like the peaceful demonstration. Now, this other day, when workers were coming out of their shift, one worker, Luigi Trastulli, who was part of this group that was coming out, and the police opened fire. So he was killed, Luigi Trastulli. He was killed. This is 1949. And over the years, the story of Luigi Trastulli's death changed. So Professor Potelli, who is a well-known oral historian in Italy, he goes back to Umbria to actually research on, this, you know, on the, the strikes that had taken place in Italy in the 1970s and whatever had gone on before that. Now, he discovered something that is very interesting. When he was talking to people, he discovered the people were insisting that Luigi Trasuli was not shot by the police just like that. He was actually impaled like Jesus and hung on a cross. And the people's memories also displaced him. From 1949, they said, look, Professor Botelli, he died, he was killed in 1953. So his interest was to try to understand why there was an error in collective memory. Why people could, why all of them together could not remember the right date. Even when historical records in the police, in the newspapers, said Luigi Trasturi had died in 1949. So he discovered something very funny because of his ability to engage with people. He discovered that in, the 19, in 1953, when people remembered that he died or displaced him, a lot of workers had lost their jobs. About 3,000 workers, and you know, the town went into deprivation. There were a lot of suicides, suicides, 
and the people remembered this as a very historical moment. So because they wanted to honor their colleague, they displaced him from 1949, they said he died in 1953. But you can only discover that, it's not that people were foolish, you can only discover the way memory works, the way people's minds works about certain issues. If you take the, the, the duty of historical investigation, the duty of your work with much care and responsibility in order to understand the perspective, not just the content, I'm emphasizing the perspective here, the content should come with the perspective. Because that also helps you to understand why people act in certain ways. So, as we emphasize the importance of community perspectives in policy formulation, how many minutes do I have? <laughs> there is still an unresolved question. What do we do now? What about us? What do we do now? In one of his last interviews, the wonderful Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, discussed the notion of listening as a moral, political, and ethical duty. What he actually meant was that listening should not be mistaken for naivety. Rather, when we are listening, we are actually entering into a conversation. It's like a holy communion, a holy conversation, that we are in, a holy communion with another person accepting, understanding their identity, acknowledging that they are equal human beings as well. So when it comes to agriculture and rural development policy formulation, there is need to structure our processes to allow people like my grandmother into the planning and implementation policies. So even the location of the discussion itself is very important. Because if you take my great-grandmother, my grandmother, or my mother, who is so, so scared of hotels and you know such kind of stuff, and you bring her to a place like this one, you have all these wines and sodas and fancy things, she will not be comfortable to contribute to this discussion. But you have to structure it in such a way that she is comfortable in her own skin. These are very important thoughts, I think, in my opinion, because they also determine the quality. We are talking about the content of the voice, we're talking about the perspective of that voice, and now the other thing, which is like my final point, is the quality of that voice. Because if we allow people to actually be in a situation where they're comfortable, we find that they're free to talk about a lot of things. So you find a lot of Western researchers, they go to Africa, they go to Southeast Asia, and they assume, there is a lot of assumption that women are so dominated within paternalistic or patriarchal societies and they don't speak. But when you come to a place like my community, of course my mother would not speak in certain forums. Now what happens, my dad, my father, who I think has no idea of what life is all about, <laughs> would, would sit there and of course contribute to the discussions and a lot of things would be said. So he would listen and as we are eating, I, I miss those times when I used to sit with my, my mother, my father and my sisters we sit, we had, you know, the dishes that we sat down to eat and I remember these moments because it was also the time when my dad and my mom and my grandmother gave us good advice about growing up, about respecting other people, so it was not just a food. And when I came here, I noticed that the Philippines has something similar. Food is not just the art of taking food and putting it in the tummy. It's sharing stories, right? When we met Sarah this morning, uh, was it at lunch? Yes, I should say lunch, and we sat down together. They were sharing stories about what happened in Africa. It's, it's an important moment. And when we were eating in Africa, when I was growing up, my father would explain what had happened in that forum where my mother was not present. My mother would listen, analyze the issue for him, and open up his mind. So when he goes back there, he spoke. And people think, even today, people think he's the most intelligent person. <laughs> and it, it, it would make anybody wonder, so who is he speaking in this case? Is it my mother? Is it my father? So if you're not careful in terms of the way you structure, research, you structure your teaching, you structure your interventions, you may assume that people are not speaking, women are not speaking. In fact, the article I referred to earlier on by Gayatri Spivak, can the subordinate and speak? It's about speech, but the politics of speech. What he argues in that article, first, the first part of the article, he condemns the Western approaches towards, you know, women in development. He criticizes this movement that was born in the UN, women in development. And he says, it was done with Western perspectives in mind. Because he believes, she believes, and she believed, as well as I believe today, that a lot of our women in the Global South are speaking, but we don't hear them, because we're not listening. 
So she gives an example of this wonderful young woman. She's, you know, she's aged about 18, 19, 20. Boba in 1920, India. They're still under British colonial rule. rule. So Boba commits suicide. But it's not just a suicide. She commits suicide when she's experiencing her mens menstruation. So the, the analysis is revolves around that menstruation. That is, she was not supposed, if it was just any other day, whether she was committing suicide or sorry, as, as, uh, as losing a love or whatever, she was not supposed to commit suicide. This is a patriarchal society deciding how women should even kill themselves. That if you want to kill yourself, you can kill yourself, but you should not be menstruating. But Bobanesori waited when she was menstruating and committed suicide. And Gayatri Spivak argues, and this is an interesting part of the article, argues that by waiting for the menstruation period to commit the suicide, she was actually writing a script. She was writing her own postscript to the way that suicide had to be read. She was speaking. That's what the article is all about. So unless you take the initiative to actually understand what is going on, you think people are not speaking. In Africa, where I grew up, my mother, I didn't know this, there was a day, I remember, we were playing, and when kids are playing, you don't want your mother to invite you to do certain things. I was little, I must have been nine or ten or whatever. So we were playing, and my mother says, can you come and put salt in the beans? These are kidney beans that she was boiling. I love beans. I haven't eaten beans yet. I love kidney beans. And I was not happy. This was something that she used to do once in a while, once in a month. I didn't understand what was going on. And I say, why can't you just do it yourself? So she slapped me. <laughs> but I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it was violence, whatever, because this is a slap of love. I mean, every time, every, every time I'm, I'm lost in the Western world where I live, I spend most of my time, I remember this moment. My mother slapped. Everything she did had a color to it. She was like a painter. She's like a painter. The way she uses words. I still remember the smell when, you know, I think I've done something terrible and I'm in need of being slapped and I know that it's not my mother. I still remember the smell of the cooking kidney beans and the slap and everything. But she slapped me and she gave me the salt, I put it in the, uh, the boiling beans. But the point is, when a woman is experiencing her men menstruation, she's not supposed to put in our culture, she's not supposed to put salt in the... Uh, the, the boiling dishes. You have to do it yourself, you know, you have to ask the kids to do it. But I didn't know because my mother could not talk to me about menstruation. So when she slapped me, she went straight to my father and said, your boy is growing, is growing bigger. So immediately, I think a season after that, I was sent for initiation. And it was here that I learned about a lot of things, about women's menstruation, respecting women. This is how things work. But you have to take to, to, to understand this process, to understand how women are communicate about things. In fact, on top of that, these are rules set by society. When my mother, because my father has always been promiscuous, even now, my mother, as a woman who is experiencing menstruation, would put a cooking stick, I love this, you know, this kind of uh, thinking, she's supposed to put a cooking stick over the pail or the bucket that has drinking water. It means any adult male in that house is not going to drink that water. And the man also knows that she cannot have sex, she cannot demand sex from the husband. So my mother, for several times, for no reason at all, there was always that cooking stick. It means she didn't want to have sex with my father, because this, these are rules set by society, but my mother could play around, she was able to play around with these rules. So the, the, the whole point is, we have to make sure that we understand, you know, the, the, the politics of voice and how people work around with voices. So what now for Siaka and you know, students and staff, ETC? What I'm calling for here is that we, we need to begin to think differently about our teaching, about our research. The African-American feminist scholar, Bell Hooks, introduces the notion of engaged pedagogy. It's coming from Paulo Freire, arguing that learning is counter-hegemonic. I'm not just talking about the classroom, I'm talking about any situation where you find yourself working with people. It's counter-hegemonic. I'm not saying you should be teaching people to rise up against the government. But offer people an opportunity to contest your own thinking. So for example, if in a community, a lot of people are experiencing, you know, a lot of women are dying during childbirth. A lot of women are dying. You don't just go there to say, look, a lot of women are dying during childbirth. We are going to construct a clinic. You don't do that. 
Rather, you find a different way of approaching this. You would say, look, according to evidence, according to statistics, according to research, a lot of women are dying during childbirth. What do you think about this? What is causing this? You may find a lot of you know, interesting answers. In fact, you may realize that the approach you wanted to take in terms of during a clinic is far much less significant in terms of solving the local problem. You need to solve another problem before that. So it's it's muy importante. It's very important that we pay attention to understanding the structural inequalities within which poverty, within which development is located. We have to reject the mechanistic, the commodified, and the orthodox bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie educational structures and, the, and approaches that emphasize the dictatorship of the professor. So I'm not just talking about the teachers here, I'm talking about all of us. Whereby we think, we think that we always know. In fact, Paulo Freire, in his last book, Letters to Christina, which he wrote as a response to a request by his niece, can you write me about your life? Can you tell me about your life? So he wrote this beautiful book for his niece. It's called Letters to Christina. It's a beautiful book. But there is one chapter there that I believe was not addressed to Christina because Christina was not studying PhD. So it was addressed to supervisors, students and supervisors working at postgraduate level. And he said, I remember, he said, the duty of the supervisor is not to appropriate the voice of the student. So when I'm supervising students today, I try to remember and I tell them that this is not my PhD, this is not my master's. I will guide you, even when we disagree, because most of the time at master's level, I want students to disagree with my thinking. I will respect your thinking. I will allow your thinking to guide me. This is, this is the humility that we talk about. This is pedagogy that the investors of the Philippines in the 1950s were talking about. That when you're dealing with other people, you have to bring yourself to their level. You have to humble yourself. In fact, there are so many instances in my experiences of teaching when students have come to me, Linja, we don't agree with you in terms of the way you articulate this notion. And I have said, give me a week. I have gone back to read the book again, to read the text again, and I realized my students were right. So the process of education, the process of you know, acquiring education should be liberating even for the teacher themselves. It should be educational for the teacher themselves. And this principle applies even within the informal education sector when we are working with farmers when we were working with kids, when we were working with women, when we were working with men, whereby they can even correct our thinking. We shouldn't feel like we are stupid. It actually shows that the process is wonderful. The process is actually achieving what it set out to, to do. So, the, in conclusion, I'm saying here, it implies that all of us, as students of society, we should go beyond what is celebrated as dominant and accepted structure and content on the subject. So sometimes, th this is my experience, after London School of Economics where I was teaching between 2008 and 2012, I took time off the academy. And this is why I have so much respect to professors and scholars here. They're not professors who are just based in the university. They're there in the field. In fact, you read Celeste Cadiz's work, it's based on what is going on in the field. You read you know, Felix Rubrero, you read everybody. It's based on what is happening in the field. And this is very important. So I took time off because I found myself becoming much more distant from the stuff that I was teaching. So I wanted to go back into development. So I went to work on, you know, HIV and AIDS projects, girls' education projects, and a couple of other projects. But the most important thing I've learned, I think, in my, you know, uh, experience, is that there is also narrow thinking going on within the field out there. Sometimes people think, you know, if you're going out to do agricultural development, just focus on what they call agricultural issues. You forget that the farmer you're dealing with is also a human being who goes to hospital. He's also a human being who goes to hospital. So at a certain point, this farmer is also a patient. This farmer you're dealing with is also promiscuous. He's cheating on his wife at a certain point. So you are dealing with a holistic individual. Or, to be equal in terms of gender, this woman you're dealing with may also be cheating her husband. <laughs> You may also be going to hospital. So this individual is not just a farming individual. You are dealing with an individual who is experiencing the totality of life. So if you're dealing with agricultural issues, be able to expand your thinking to deal with other issues that you might think are not agricultural related issues. The final issue that I want us to emphasize in terms of um, our discussion today is the importance of uh, the curriculum, the, 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 the teaching curriculum. 
that we need to allow students, in terms of our assignments, now I'm speaking to my fellow teachers and academics here, we need to provide a space in terms of the assignments, in terms of the assessments, in terms of the way we teach. We need to provide an opportunity for students to contribute to the process of teaching and learning. So I did something radical this year. It has never been done at RMIT. My class, Communication for Development. No, it was another class. I think uh, Critical Inquiry, Media and Communication. I asked the students to set the exams themselves. And I know it set a couple of figures roughly within the institution. But I asked them, I said, no, I'm expecting five questions that you're going to answer. You know, uh, uh, two of them for two hours. So I would like you to set the questions. Give me the five questions. So they took a long time, a couple of weeks, they were talking through the topics we had discussed, and they came up with the questions. And I said, after the question, how do you want me to mark these questions? So they gave me a marking rubric. <laughs> so after giving me the marking rubric, this is how you, we want you to assess this exam. It was really fascinating, because from the process of learning, and they had already contributed the topics that I was teaching, I said, look, what do you want me to teach you this year? So they gave me the topics. They set the exams. And I said, look, give me the marking rubrics. We discussed, they said, Ninja, you know, theory, yes, we love the theory. But, you know, you are putting too much theory in your teaching. Can you add these aspects as well? So, these are radical things. But now the problem is, sometimes students can push you in a corner, an intellectual corner that you're not comfortable with. So that's a danger. You become vulnerable. And the unfortunate thing about university education is that a lot of us, we, we, we try to pretend that we know everything. It doesn't work like that. In fact, when I'm starting to teach, I begin by acknowledging my ignorance. That I'm teaching this course. But there are other aspects that I'm not aware. And I'm hoping that through our interactions, you're also going to help me to understand these issues much better. That's why it is imperative in the closing statements now, in terms of pedagogy of listening, it's not just keeping quiet when somebody is speaking. It's acknowledging. It's the ability to see other people. Even when we disagree with them, we have to undertake the noble duty, the ethical duty, the political duty of understanding the perspective that we might be uncomfortable with. In the words of uh, my favorite general, General Douglas MacArthur, the commander of the Allied forces during the Second World War, especially during the surrender of the Japanese uh, Empire aboard the USS Missouri on September 2nd, 1945. The proceedings are closed. 